medical, uh, the medical issue and, and brought that up. And I, so I want to transition over to Dr. Oliverson. And you work in the medical profession, and a lot of people are surprised talking about this issue that there aren't any really medical protocols in place uh, for gender transitioning. Is this, is this a common thing in the medical field? Is this common in other areas? Well, I think we'd have to say that this is a relatively recent phenomenon, right? I mean, it's interesting, I, right before I came on stage, I was sort of doing a little Medline search and looking, you know, for some of the articles, uh, and uh, I ran across your uh, psychologist from California. Uh, you know, most of these articles are within the last 10 years, where they're talking about this is what you should do, and this is how you should do it, and, and it really is sort of, it appears to me, and I'm not, I'm not just saying this, because uh, I'm here, but I, just thinking of it as a, as a scientist looking at it, trying to be objective, it really does sort of seem like they're inventing it as they go along. Um, and you know, to uh, Jeff, to your point, I mean, I hope you guys appreciate something that, that Mr. Younger said that just absolutely makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Whenever you have a, quote, scientific profession, that 50% of their publications of what they claim to be scientifically valid knowledge is not reproducible. That's junk science, folks. Yeah. In order for something to move from a hypothesis to a theory, by definition from the scientific method, it has to be reproducible. The reason we know that gravity is a law is because it's reproducible. If I drop this microphone right now, you all know what's gonna happen because you've seen it a thousand times. It's reproducible. Um, that's scary. And I will tell you one other thing related to that is that I think uh, since I've been, so I've been a doctor for 20 years now, and before that I was in a biology lab, and so I've been in the scientific method for the better part of 30 years, I am deeply disturbed by the effect that social media is having on the scientific method. Uh, coronavirus has really brought that to the forefront, but we see an unprecedented uh, sense of power that folks get when they take a study that's maybe not a well-designed study, not peer-reviewed, and they just sort of share it out there on cyberspace. And people just pick that up and they run with it. I mean, and it could be totally unvalid. I mean, there were circumstances, and it's not just the psychologists. There have been circumstances in the last three months related to coronavirus where prestigious medical journals have had to retract studies because they found, oops, we published that before we verified it, or our verification was incomplete. I am truly scared going forward as a doctor about the integrity of our scientific process. I want to also say that you heard both of these gentlemen say something which I think is really profoundly important, and that, and that is you are starting to see in the psychology literature with respect to you know, transgenderism and transitioning and this kind of thing, an acknowledgement that what goes up must come down. And you're gonna see tremendous pushback on that, but it just goes to show you the hypocrisy that's involved here and the magical thinking that's involved here to think that if a person feels dysphoric about their gender at some point in their life, that they can't possibly get to a point later in their life where they feel differently. Uh, it's a one-way street for these folks, and that really disturbs me uh, that, that there would be that thought process that you can't, uh, you can never go back. So as I was driving up here this morning, let me just say this as well, as I was driving up here this morning, I was thinking a little bit about the natural world, uh, because it occurs to me that transgenderism is really something we only see in human beings. Um, my wife and I love birds, and we have a lot of bird friends in our backyards, but our favorite are the cardinals. And we've been blessed to have a pair of cardinals every year for as long as I can remember, and they're really fun to watch. And it's a classic case, so even if we didn't have the Bible in front of us, we still have general revelation, right? Even Charles Darwin could observe what he saw in the world around him. So one thing I notice about cardinals is there are males and there are females. They have specific roles. It takes one male and one female to basically do what it is that, that sex and dimorphism exists to do, and that is ensure the survival of the species. Get from this generation to the next generation because the flesh ultimately fails, uh, and so you're not going to be here forever. And so if you intend for your family to continue on, you probably need to start thinking about having children, right? It's no different with birds. Um, I have never seen a female cardinal try to put on red feathers and act like a male. 
And if she did, now, now my daughter and I have had this conversation several times, and she says, Daddy, I don't understand the male birds are so much prettier than the female birds, and why is that? And I said, well, sweetheart, it's because God gave them specific roles, and they're fulfilling those roles. And the reason that the female cardinal is sort of a grayish brown or brownish gray is because she spends more time on the nest, and you don't want the predator to know where the nest is. And so, the, you know, her job is one that she spends a majority of the time incubating the eggs, and so we don't want her to be discovered, right? So she's camouflaged. God has camouflaged her. Whereas the male, you know, his job is to be out there singing his song and establishing territory and getting food, and if necessary, distracting predators and ultimately possibly to be eaten uh, so that she survives and his offspring survives. So that's, that's how it works in the natural world. Uh, I, but I've never seen, uh, I've never seen a cardinal go from being male to female or vice versa, and if it did, that species wouldn't survive. So from a natural perspective, this whole concept is an aberration. It doesn't really make sense in the in the greater context of what the the um, the naturalist would say the purpose of sexual dimorphism is to begin with, which is procreation. Uh, so I think it's important that we not sort of and look, uh, my friends on the other side of this, doctors included, would say, well, but you know, there's testicular feminization and there are these other conditions, and you know, this happens all the time. Well, it doesn't happen all the time. Right? It does happen, but just because it happens doesn't mean that it should be the norm, especially when it defies the natural order of things, which is essentially how the rest of the animal universe functions.